Uh, so I'm going to give just a little bit of background uh, on myself and the team and kind of where this stuff is coming from. And then what I'm going to do is take you through a very nuts and bolts presentation on just absolute features that we've released that you guys could start taking advantage of tomorrow to help grow your audiences using different Google features and technologies across all Google properties. Um, so first, a little bit of where this is coming from. So the background story on the Google Plus platform team is that a really big chunk of that team actually came in when Google acquired a company called Mebo that I was a co-founder of. And when we were doing Mebo, uh, we went for like you know seven years, and um, we were doing a lot of really fun technology. Actually, just so you guys can see it, raise your hand if you're in this room and you're a part of the Mebo acquisition. So in this room alone, we've got probably like seven people from Mebo. So uh, as part of Mebo, we'd talk to Google a bunch, and we'd say, "Hey Google, like there are these features that we really want you to do." And of course, selfishly as an entrepreneur, I wanted Google to do it because it would help Mebo grow its audience. And uh, I could never really convince Google to do it when I was Mebo. But then Mebo went and got acquired by Google, and I got on the inside, and I went to everybody here, and I said, hey, like, there are these features I always wanted you guys to do. Why didn't you do them? And you know, the answer that came back was basically, oh, well, we've never had you know, the team to do them, and we didn't have someone who kind of had the vision for those kinds of features. But if you guys want to start making those things happen, then go ahead and start you know, building those features. And so a lot of the features that you're going to see today were literally produced by an entrepreneur startup team that came into Google specifically for what we wanted when we were entrepreneurs and start you know, a startup in your guys' seats. Right? So that's where a lot of this is coming from. It's literally, hey, you know, if you're doing a startup, if you're trying to grow an audience, what could Google do to really help you? And so that's really the, the basis for where a lot of this comes from. Um, with that, let me just jump into uh, some, of this, uh, some of these features here. So you know, Vic just did a pretty good job, I think, of giving you guys kind of the Google Plus overview. But you know, in a, if I were to just summarize what Vic just said to you, right? Google Plus is very much about giving you a relevant experience across all of Google. Right? And you just heard that kind of loud and clear. And I think that's a really important thing to grok about Google Plus that, you know, frankly, before I got to Google, I didn't completely understand. Right? Google Plus is really, can we give you a better experience on your Android device? Or can we give you a better experience in Search or in Maps? Because we know more about you, we know more about your friends, and we can therefore give you a much better experience. Right? And like Vic was just saying, the way that Google Plus was built was to both help Google create a better experience for its users at its properties, but then also to help the rest of the internet create a better experience for its users at its properties. Right? And of course, a really big thing for, I assume, all of you, was certainly a really big thing for Mebo, was can we help you grow? Right? At the end of the day, a huge thing for everybody sitting in the room is, how much are we helping grow your audience? And so when we thought it, sat down and kind of said, look, what are the three big goals that we want to help developers achieve? It really came down to you know, grow the number of absolute uniques, because right? that's a really big deal. At the end of the day, we're always looking at kind of the top line, like how many uniques do we have coming into the system right? on a you know, daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, you know, when we were Mebo, we like to look at our monthly numbers because they're a little bit bigger. Google's big enough that we can look at our daily numbers, and those look pretty good too at Google. <laughs> um, can we help you deepen engagement? Right. So, top line growth is great and all, but if you don't have users coming back regularly, then obviously the top line growth just kind of flames out, and it was kind of like burning newspaper. Everybody sitting here, you guys all know that viscerally. So we said, hey, we really want to help people deepen engagement of their existing users. And then, you know, obviously, these days, mobile is becoming kind of the de facto standard, right? You think about mobile first. Um, you know, in my team, we instituted a rule really early on that all product mocks that came forward when we were thinking about new features had to be mobile mocks first. Like, you could not bring desktop mocks forward. And then if you wanted to talk about desktop, that's great, but they had to sit behind a mobile mock. 
And that's how important mobiles become, right? I mean, you know, I, most publishers I talk to at this point, the traffic is at least 30% from mobile, if not 60 plus percent. So we said, hey, what can we do to help people drive Android installs? How can we really focus on mobile and create a much better experience, not just on the mobile device itself, but connecting mobile devices to the web and trying to make something really seamless there? So you'll see a lot of that uh, in the features I'm going to go through. So that's the lead-in. And with that, I'm now going to just dive into straight features that hopefully help you guys uh, figure out what you could do to uh, help grow your audiences with some Google technology. So the first one, um, this one's really awesome. Uh, how many people here uh, run some kind of business or are part of some kind of business that could have a you know, presence on the internet? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, good. How many of you have a Google Plus page? Raise your hand if you have an active Google Plus page. Okay, about 50%. So early on, um, we did a feature which said, hey, in Google search, search is always looking for fresh, relevant content to show users who are doing searches. In fact, one of the things we learned in Google search is that fresh content gets clicked on much more regularly than stale content, which is not surprising, right? You guys do an update to your app, you always see that little uptick in growth, right, the second you do an update. And so we, one of the things we said is, hey, where can we get fresh content if someone searches for your property? So let's say you're from SoundCloud, and someone does a search from SoundCloud, or GQ Magazine, and someone says, hey, I'm looking for a GQ Magazine, and they type GQ Magazine up, up in the search bar. Well, an obvious place to get fresh content is from your Google Plus page. And so what we've done is if you have an active Google Plus page, Right? It has to be active because the content has to be fresh. Then on the right-hand side of the search results, where you'd normally see ads, instead you see a little bit of information about, you know, in this case, GQ, and you see the most recent post that they've made on their Plus page. Right? So this is, if you think about it, this is one of the best ways to kind of help people searching for your property see the content that you would want them to see. Because if you've recently posted it on your Plus page and someone does a search for your brand on Google, that content is extremely likely to appear in the right-hand side of search. Um, yeah, this is a desktop feature um, for now. Uh, does that one make sense? Yeah, and by the way, I'm happy to do this iteratively with questions as I go. So yep. Is it always the most recent post on your Google Plus page that shows up on the right? Yes, it's the most recent post. And I get the question a lot to head this one off. If I start today, will I see it in an hour? <laughs> um, it, won't, it won't be an hour. Uh, like a lot of things with Google, the answer is the machines figure it out. Um, but just begin posting regularly and check back on the search for your uh, brand, and you'll see it happen reasonably quickly. Any other questions on this one before I go on? This is like the no-brainer of this conversation. Active plus page equals, you know, a little bit of help with search. Yeah, fire. Is it when you show the first result of the page, or is it directly searching This is when someone's directly searching for you. Okay, last question on this one. Yep, fire. I'm going to talk about mobile apps and search in a second. The oh, sorry. The question was, uh, will this? Ins I think your question was, will this install a mo your mobile app if you are a mobile app? Yep. So I'm going to I'm going to go through a little bit of search in mobile apps in a second. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next feature. I hope you guys grokked this one and it was helpful. So next one, let's talk about search and mobile apps. So we just announced this, uh, I think, was it yesterday? Okay. Today. Wow. So today this was announced uh, by a search team. So when a relevant search is made where you would come up in that search result, we are now enabling deep links into your app when they are on that user's phone. Right? So in this case, 
when the search comes back up, someone does a search for like, you know, James Stewart holiday movie, and there was an IMDB result that made sense for that user, there is now a deep link to IMDB to that result inside that app because that user did that search, right? So this is the first time we're deep linking from search straight into the right place inside your mobile app. And this is obviously should be very, very powerful to drive growth for you guys. It shows up if you're on the phone. We're looking for the, uh, the app that the user is most likely to use based on what they've got on their device. And so then figuring out, hey, you know, IMDB, we're going to deep link in there. Yeah, so the question is, didn't, didn't this, wasn't there always a way to register a handler? Um, so there were ways in the past to register a handler. Someone could, uh, Vic Frizel probably could give the, um, a deeper answer to this, but um, there were ways to register a handler for search. This is getting those results much more prominently into the mobile search and, and getting that deep link in for you. It, exactly. Um, the other piece to this release that we just announced is in addition to deep linking for certain searches, we're now also having kind of the right apps that might make sense for a given search appear and letting you know that you can go ahead and download those apps from the search result results. They will send you into Google Play to let a user find your app and install your app. And then uh, there is a URL down for each one of these. You'll see a URL at the bottom that'll help you figure out exactly where to go to learn more. So this one is slash app dash indexing. All right, next, uh, next set of features I'm going to run through. So um, this one is one of my absolute favors, favorites to do what you wanted, which is drive Android app installs. Um, we found a lot of users didn't even know that web properties had an associated mobile app. It's like I go to you know, ESPN.com all the time, and I just didn't even know that there was an Android app available for ESPN.com. And so we wanted to find a way to make it super simple for users to discover that app, particularly if they're already a fan of a given property. So what we built, and this is an example of Fitbit doing it, is if a user connects or signs into that property using Google+, we now know that that user is a fan of that website, right? Do it on Fitbit.com, uh, do it on, you know, I don't know, SoundCloud.com, TuneIn, et cetera. And when the user logs in, they get the normal off dialog that says, hey, you're going to connect, you know, make a connection between Fitbit and Google. Are you okay with that? And if that user has an Android device, could be a tablet, could be a phone, doesn't matter if it's on their person, right? They could have forgotten it at home, it could be in their pocket, in their desk drawer. We'll know, and then we'll bring up another dialog that says, hey, would you also like to install Fitbit on your Android device? If they have multiple devices, we just put up a little menu that says, hey, you know, which device would you like to put this on? And when the user clicks Install, that application is now directly installed onto the device and hits their home screen. The user never touched their mobile device, right? They just found you on the web somewhere. And they chose to make a connection between Google and your property. And because we did that, we assume the person is a fan of you and so would probably want your, um, want your mobile app. And so we're now giving them the option to get your mobile app. This is probably the most seamless way possible to drive installs of your Android app, right? The only users who will see this are users who have an Android device, right? So if they don't have an Android device, we will not show them the screen. And if they already have your app, we won't show them the screen, of course. But if there's someone with an Android device who doesn't yet have your app, we'll ask them, do you want it? And if they say yes, users, you know, it'll be on their device. Now, we often get the question, hey, this is great. How many users actually say yes? And on average, 40% of people who get asked, hey, do you want the app, say yes. For Fitbit, it's been 60%. And I've seen it go as low as about 25%. So you know, some, some sites are doing better than others. 
But all of those percentages are massively, massively better than the conversion that you get on ads that you're buying to drive installs of your mobile app. So this is an awesome way to drive Android installs. Yep, you've had a question for a while. So yeah, this is a user signs in using Google on your website. Because they've signed in using Google, we now know who that person is on Google. We know that you both use Google. You're like, you're this person on Google, and you're this person on, on, um, on this website. People are logged into their Android devices at the OS level. So if you have an Android device, we know that you have that device. And we then say on the website, hey, do you want the Android app? And if you say yes, the Android app just appears on your phone the next time you pick it up. You're only going to get prompted once. Yep. And that's the prompt that has the 40% accept rate on average. And fire. Good question. So um, the question was, if your brand has multiple apps, how do you weight those, and can you, can, you, can you display several? So right now, we only support downloading one app, um, unfortunately. The request for multiple apps we've gotten from large brands, uh, we haven't yet uh, figured out a way to make that work. So right now, what we've recommended to brands is Use, use the app that is most associated with the given property. So if someone's on like ESPN and it's Sports Center, then give them the Sports Center app, right? Versus you know if it's some other uh, of your properties, then give them that app. Yep, back in the room. Uh, the question was from which OS version is this compatible? And I think it's Froyo or Gingerbread. Which one? Froyo and above. Froyo and above. So basically, all basically ninety plus percent of Android devices, this will work for. One last question on this one, and then I'm going to move on to the next feature. Yep, fire. Does this work for paid apps? Does it work for what? Sorry? Paid apps. Does it work for paid apps? Good question. Not, not right now. All right, with this one, I'm going to move on. So uh, Net, if you want to drive Android installs, this is a really, really good way to do it. Right? All the users who go to your website, if they have an Android device, this is the best way to get them an Android app. Um, by the way, almost all the features that I'm going to touch on today work for any web browser, work for Android, and work for iOS. This is the one feature that we cannot do on iOS, unfortunately. I wish we could. Um, but this one we can only do on Android. OK, so next thing. We've now figured out a way to get your users to ha very likely have your Android app. And your users both use you on the web, right? They use you on Android. They might use you on an iPad. Right? They use you across multiple devices. In fact, they probably uh, use you at work and at home. Right? So a huge problem in today's world is just cross-device fragmentation. Right? I don't know, you know, when we were Mebo, we were like, which ones of these unique IPs are actually unique users? We don't, we don't really know. Because right? you've got like, an IP in one place, an IP in a different place, and it might actually be the same person at work and home. And so we're trying to create a way to make that really seamless to connect a single user across all devices for you. So the way we've done that is we've all implemented cross-device single sign-in. What that means is if a user signs in with Google Plus on, to your property on any device, they will now be automatically signed in across all devices. So they sign in to you on their desktop PC at work. And then they go home. If they navigate to your, you know, to your app on their home machine, they will automatically be signed in to your app on their home machine. They don't have to touch anything. It just happened. And then they pick up their Android phone, and they you know, open up your app. They are automatically connected on your Android app. They didn't have to touch anything. You now know that that user, that Amy, is Amy at, when she's at work, when she's at home, when she's on her Android device, or on her iOS device. This is, if you think about the implications for this, for gaming, for example, it's really great for saving state, right? Like getting the user back to the same level that they've been at. For commerce, it's amazing, right? Someone starts filling in a shopping cart on you know, their Android device and abandons. And we all know a lot of people abandon, right? But then they go home and they go back to your site, and their shopping cart is already filled up, right? Because they're automatically connected. They don't have to connect again. 
So this one's incredibly powerful, ad targeting. Right? You now know, you know if you build an interest profile on someone on one device, you can then take that interest profile and know that it's the same person and ad target them appropriately on the other device, or just giving them a more personalized, relevant experience. Right? So this is the most seamless way to know that a user is a user across every device they access you on. Seth, Fire. what's the uh, credential valid time for this? Uh, it just, it's the same as, um, oh, sorry, the repeat. The question was, what's the credential valid time? So it's the same thing for Google Plus sign in the token uh, doesn't expire. Fire. How do you identify uh, a machine to a user? So the question was, how do we identify a machine to a user? So all of this, Vic actually mentioned it a little bit. He uh, referenced this when he talked early on. So this is piggybacking on the back of the Google sign in. So if the user signed in on that device, we know that that user is that user. Right? And so we're piggybacking on the, we're basically letting your sign in piggyback on the Google sign in to then know, OK, this is this user across devices. So the user signs into Gmail or Maps. Gmail or Maps or Search. As long as they are signed in in that instance of that you know, either browser or device, then this will work for you too, because we're able to go carry that through, even if it's a different app on uh, Android. On, I on iOS, if a user signs in on iOS, it carries to every device seamlessly. Um, if a user navigates to your app on iOS and they're already connected, that's the one place where we need one tap because we aren't able to do that cross device. Um, we can't do the cross app immediate uh, connection. We need one tap. Everywhere else, it's zero. Any other questions on this one? Fire. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Users can sign out uh, easily, either with your own app or on the Google side. I'm going to move on. So at this point, we've gone through a really, really easy way to get you know, users' information about you on search right, by connecting a Plus page. Then we went into, OK, well, how can we drive more Android installs? right? And then we talked about how can we have a user across all devices be a single user to you so that you know who that person is and can give them a much better experience. So let's see what we've got next. So let's talk a little bit about sharing. Um, you know, obviously, a uh, really important thing for everybody is how do you do just straight up new user acquisition. Right? And so we've built some really powerful sharing channels that uh, hopefully will help you guys get new user acquisition. And if you watch closely, this is actually the first time that we've opened up the Google notifications channel to developers in order to be able to message, uh, for a user on your system to be able to message their friends back on Google. So let's see how that works. So let's say that you prompt the user to share to Google in some way. Right? So when the user enters the share flow, first off, you know, I'd make sure that you're uh, taking advantage of all the various places that you can grab a user's uh, friends to let them share too, right? So one is when a user does a connection with Google+, right? They have access to all their Google+, friends. There's also the Contacts API, right, from Android. So you can also get the Contacts API and get a list of a user's friends that way too. Once you have a list of the user's friends and you prompt the user to share, you are able, as a developer, to programmatically send in up to 10 people's friends' names in the to field of a share box from Google+. So you can do that as a developer, right? So you could grab, in fact, you can even get a rank ordered list of friends based on affinity from Google+. That's an API call that we support. And then you could show a box that says, hey, you know, which of your friends do you want to send this video to? And then once that user chooses up to 10 friends right, and hits OK Share, we'll put you into this Google UI, and you will pre-populate up to 10 names in the To field. right? Because you want to make it really, really easy for the users to decide who they're going to send something to. Now, if you've done that, if there are individuals' names in the To field, when the user hits Send, their friends will get a message across all Google properties in the notification system. 
So that little bar that's in the upper right on every Google property, right? You see it on Search, Maps, Plus, YouTube. There's no place in Google, effectively, that does not have the notification system built in. So if I sent you know, an, a message, that, a video that I wanted to share, and I'd put Vix and Amy's names in that video, in that share, then they will have their notifier light up across Google properties. And so this is really the first time that we've made it easy for you as a developer to get access to the Google notification system. So this is a very, very powerful way to help your users bring their friends into your app. Now it's also, I'm going to stop there, and then we'll talk about one other feature. Questions on this one before I go on? Because this one I know is nuanced, but very powerful. Yep. Uh, the question was, is it possible to determine which one of your friends already use your app? Yes, um, that is not yet available as an API call. You could do it on your side. Uh, that would definitely be in the category of, geez, we should probably do that. Okay. So watch for it. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a logical next step. Yep, so the question was, uh, I mentioned that we have an affinity algorithm, so we can return a list of friends based on affinity. What does that look like? Unfortunately, we don't have a way to rank it based on kind of affinity by interest. We only have overall affinity, which is basically how much does this person communicate with in a broad Google-wide sense, this other person. So right now, that's going to be kind of a, a good ranked list for general affinity, but not sliced by interest. Um, that would be awesome, probably not in the near term. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on with this one. We'll take questions at the end, too. Um, but this one, like I said, great way to get in the notification stream. Now, the next thing is when a user gets this you know, item that was shared, so in this case, you know, check out Google Street View conquering the oceans, notice that it's got that view button down at the bottom, right? Like a very specific, hey, the action on this share is to view. or you know, here we've got a share that's coming in, I think, from TuneIn. And there's a very specific call to action here. It's listen. Right? So what we've done is we've created a type of share that we call an interactive post that has a really prominent call to action. That really prominent call to action gets, on average, three times the click rate of a normal share. And it's just because. It's such a very clear like, signal to the user, hey, I'm supposed to you know, click to listen, or click to join, or click to play. Right? I think there are 150 verbs that we support here. And we just chose 150 because we wanted to translate them into every language for you guys. If you have verbs in your mind that we don't have on the list, you, know, <laughs> you can feel free to uh, let us know, and we can probably add them. So this is a really great way to make sure that when a user gets the share, they know, like, hey, I'm supposed to click this to play or to, to join or whatever the action is that you want. All right, so if I were to sum this, this kind of section up, right? we talked about search. We talked about installing Android apps and keeping, keeping users connected across devices. This one is, hey, how can I get my existing users to invite their friends across Google? Right? No, it doesn't matter where their friends are on Google. If they're on Google+, if they're on YouTube, if they're on Maps, search. How can I get my friends across all Google properties to come and then take action inside your property? And oh, by the way, from a growth perspective, not only will this send your users' friends to your app, if let's say I receive you know, this share from Katie and I don't have TuneIn on my device, on both iOS and Android, we'll send Katie to the App Store or to the Play Store so Katie can get the app. And then once Katie has, or sorry, in this case, I get the app. And once I have the app, I'll get deep linked to the right place inside that app. So this can drive app installs for you as well seamlessly across platforms. All right, next one. Um, so we've taken the same concept and applied it to email. So uh, we recently launched something called Smart Mail. I think this is still whitelist. Is that right? This is still whitelist. So you'd have to ping. Who are, who are we going to tell people to ping Vic? You're going to ping Vic Frizel at google.com. <laughs> um, so you'll ping Vic. And you can add a little bit of markup to the emails that you send people 
will recognize the markup and put the same kind of kind of visual actions into Gmail, the same way we're doing it for those shares. So it's a really, really clear call to action like, hey, you know, meeting at a cafe, are you going? Yes, maybe no. And we haven't talked about kind of what the level of increased engagement we see when there's a really clear call to action that's kind of in the UI on Gmail, but it's been pretty staggering. So this is just some really easy markup. Again, remember, for, to get more details on all this, there's the kind of URL on the bottom right there. To get more interaction with your emails that you're sending people, do a little bit of markup and get a really clear call to action for users. All right, so this is applying the same sharing concept from kind of the shares across Google to email. And I should have said about the shares across Google too, I just think I should probably make this explicit. This action, when it's shared inside the notification system on any property, so here it's being shared into maps, notice that the, the action appears right on that share at maps. And that will send the user straight into your app or straight over to your website. Right? So we're not kind of moving them within Google and then over to your site. We're just sending them straight as traffic to you. All right, next one. This one's one of my favorites. So um, how many of you operate a site that has UGC, user-generated content, in your hand? It's about a third. Great. So this is particularly relevant if you operate a UGC site. So if people are creating content on your site, Sometimes that content appears in Google search, right? You know, someone authors a blog post, for example, on WordPress, and that blog post you know, can get picked up by Google's crawler and end up in search. And we wanted to create a way to make it more clear where that actually came from and who authored that content. And so for a while, we had this feature called authorship that let someone's like, you know, picture and link to their Google Plus profile appear in the search results. Um, but we wanted to make it really, really easy and kind of democratize that feature and make it available for everyone. So now, if your users sign into your site using Google+, we take that as a signal that they definitely use your property. And when we go find content inside your property, of course, that's public, that's crawlable, and we put it into the Google search engine, it will now benefit from authorship automatically. So as long as you've marked up that content with the rel equals author links so that we know, right? We're now trusting you because we've seen that that user has indeed used your property because they connected Google to your property. And we're then just automatically applying authorship to it back at search. And that user's name and a link to their profile and oftentimes their picture will then appear. So this is an awesome way to just help your users and you get more, obviously, more visibility on the result inside search. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and the, pa the question was, in the, uh, by automatic, what exactly do I mean? Yeah, so in the past, this was pretty difficult to hook up. Like, a user would have had to, what I'd see people doing, and we thought of this because we saw, like, crazy ways people were hooking this up where they had some teaching thing on their site, like, hi, you use, you know, Vimeo. Here's the way to link your, you know, Vimeo, uh, you know, uh, videos on Google search to you. <laughs> Go to this Google Plus page. Put your name in here when you find this little button that's hidden. We've gotten rid of all of that. Now, as long as the user is connected Google Plus to your property, it will just work for that user as long as you've got the Rel equal authors tag on your pages. Uh, next one. So um, I'm going to now enter kind of the broad section of, and I didn't talk about this yet, so I'm going to take a moment to do it. When you do that initial Google Plus sign-in, when you make that initial connection between a user and your property, you can ask at that point for effectively any API that Google has to offer about that user. Like That is the point at which you can say, hey, I want access to your calendar, or I want your email address, right? or I want to subscribe you to a YouTube channel. There are amazing things that you can ask that create a really deep link between the user's entire Google experience and your property. And I'm just going to go through some of those things that you can ask for now that are, of course, growth-oriented. So one, you know, calendar. When a user connect, makes a connection to your app, if you really do anything that's time-related, ask for permission to read and write to a user's Google calendar. 
right? If they book a you know, travel reservation on your property, like put that booking automatically on that calendar without that user taking any action at all. That makes a lot of sense. Right? So that's one thing that you can ask for and do. Um, another one that's really neat is you can get access to store things on that user's Google Drive. Right? So view and manage Google Drive files that you've opened or created with this app. So if a user is creating content on your property, you could literally automatically store that into the user's Google Drive account. And you just got permission to do that at the beginning, right when a user connected Google with your property. This one's amazing. Subscribe to our videos. Right? So if you have videos, if you have a YouTube channel, and you want a user to be subscribed to the videos on your YouTube channel, you can ask for that permission too when a user signs in. And so the, user, you know, the permission appears right there in the normal Google Plus sign-in dialog. And then when a user goes and looks at their subscriptions in YouTube, the subscription is just there. Right? So you know, I've gone through a bunch of features that are tied to Google Plus sign-in, like uh, you know, installing an Android app or keeping a user connected across devices. But really, at that one point, you are creating fundamentally a connection between that user's Google experience across kind of all Google properties and your own property. And so it's a great time to ask for things like calendar access or like a YouTube subscription. And you can even ask for uh, uh, recommendations. right? So YouTube has an API where you can ask for recommendations for a given user. Right? Like, what videos would this person like? And we've seen people use that as a recommendations engine. Right? So this is what we believe that particular user would like. And then you can use that, of course, to tune your own recommendations, too. So the last one uh, in this category that I want to spend a moment on is asking for wallet permission. So when a user uh, signs in with Google to your property, if you want the user to buy anything from you. We've seen amazing results with people asking for permission to use Wallet for purchasing. And then that becomes a really simple action for the user once they land on your checkout screen. It's like tap, and you're done. And that's incredibly powerful. We've seen, like I said, incredible results. I think we have one to share at the end here. So if we're going to sum up kind of some of the success stories that we've seen with partners, because you know, I'm sure you guys are wondering, hey, how does all this stuff perform? So I've already talked about Fitbit, where they're seeing a 60% accept rate on the Android app installs, which is pretty awesome. Um, you know, overall, uh, Flickster said, hey, 35% of our web traffic and 45% of Android users are choosing to sign in with Google+. Um, one of the most interesting things that I found in all of this, so we launched the Google Plus sign-in Notion about uh, eight or nine months ago. Right? So the Mevo team got here, like I said. It took us a few months to get it out, and then we got it out. And uh, I'll tell you a story about something that I completely screwed up. So when we got here, my theory was sign-in by itself was completely irrelevant and didn't matter. Right? It was like, great, we have a Google sign-in option. That doesn't matter. What matters are the features that we put behind it. Like you know, a user signs in, and you now have access to their calendar. Or a user signs in, and now we can help you drive an Android install. So my theory was it was all about the features, and not at all about sign-in. And then we launched it, and it turned out I was completely wrong. It turned out that just having a Google sign-in option next to whatever else you use, Twitter, Facebook, native, literally lifts the percentage of users who choose to sign into your app. That one, to me, was shocking. I didn't see that one coming. Right? But literally just lifting the absolute number of users who choose to register with you. And in retrospect, it's obvious. Right? It turns out that you know, native is kind of a pain. Right? People fear spam from like Facebook. Right? It's like, OK, if I sign in, then I'm going to spam my friends. And people don't have that fear around Google. right? They trust Google. And so you'll notice a lot of the features that we've talked about, like driving an Android install or keeping a user connected across devices. All of that is a user election. Even the stuff around getting into the notification stream on Google, which we've now opened up, right? that's user election. right? The user's choosing to do a share. 
So we're not doing kind of auto share. So we're keeping users in a really comfortable place and giving users control. But at the same time, it all helps you guys drive growth. So you know, Pix have said to that point on driving increased registration that they literally saw a 21% increase in registration by virtue of adding the Google option, which really surprised me. And then the final one, higher order value. So uh, Fancy literally saw that on average, a user who signed in with Google and had that wallet permission there, right? on average, their order value was 14% higher. And that's amazing, right? And it's just because making that connection between, in this case, wallet and fancy, right, by doing that Google sign-in made shopping easier. And not to mention, this was really interesting, it came back from them, they believe a big part of that as well is actually the cross-device single sign-on as well. People, like I said, people creating a shopping cart on one device, right, and then abandoning but then later accessing Fancy on another device, their shopping cart's already there. Maybe they choose to add something else to it, and then they go ahead and hit purchase. All right, so that's the kind of bulk of what I wanted to go through. I hope it was helpful. Um, I'm definitely gonna take questions for a little bit, but if I just were to sum all this up, right, at the end of the day, the first thing we talked about, right, if you have an active plus page, your most recent post appears on the right-hand side of Google search. This is the easiest way to help your users find content about you when they search for you on Google, right? And to make sure they're finding content that you, th you think would be interesting for them, right? Driving Android installs. If a user connects with you on the web, make it unbelievably easy for them to just hit one button on the web and download an app onto their device. Keeping that user connected across all devices, right? Once they've connected on one device, they're connected on all devices. Awesome for things like you know, shopping carts, ad targeting, more relevant user experiences, right? Knowing your statistics better. And then you know, with Google sign-in, at Core, we went through a lot of features that you can ask for, right? <coughs> Permissions like Calendar or Drive or Wallet. When a user does a Google, you know, kind of connects Google, they're connecting all of Google to your app, and as long as you've asked for that permission, right, you will get by default the user's name and the user's profile picture and their list of friends. But you can ask for more. You can ask for their email address. You can ask for permission to see their calendar and to write to their calendar. So think about which permissions you would want and ask for those so that you can create a much richer experience for that user on your property.